what a weekend we had. Happy Father's Day to everybody out there that is a father or even a father figure, stepfathers as well. Uh, Bob Huggins out. Now, people think that I take pleasure in this. No, Bob Huggins getting hammered, having a .21 alcohol level, having beer cans in his front seat, having beer cans in the back. It doesn't change what I've always told you about Huggins. Huggins is a dirtbag. Huggins has always been. Look, here's the deal. I like Bob Huggins. I do. I just don't respect Bob Huggins, and I'm going to tell you why. I've never respected Bob Huggins. you got to understand this. When he went to the University of Cincinnati, all the little high school coaches love bringing their teams to team camp. All the little high school coaches love working Bob Huggins' is, uh, kids' camps. You know why? Because Huggins would bring strippers into the locker room after all the kids went to bed. Huggins had the DUI buses going downtown. They loved it. So I'm not surprised by this. I remember thinking, damn, this is what you do on a college campus? Now, again, I was high and mighty. I was working for Bob Knight. We thought we invented goodness and light, and we were superior morally. But I got to tell you, strippers in the locker room on a college campus, even before the, the current stage of, well, we have got to police everything. I knew that that was some jackassery, and I wasn't for it. But high school coaches loved it. Oh, my God, they used to talk about it. They'd come work our camp in Indiana and be like, hey, Dan, where's the strippers? I go at the strip joint. What are you talking about? I'll go have a beer with you, but we're not going to sit here and take a bus so you all can get hammered downtown, which I didn't even mind. It's smart. He should have done it himself. But uh, strippers. In the locker room, allegedly, because I had so many high school coaches tell me this. So Huggins' ending is fitting from how he started at UC. Strippers, the whole deal, to ending on a DUI, thinking he's in Columbus, Ohio, thinking he don't know where the hell he is. It's a fitting ending. Now let me go this route. Maybe this is the life Huggins likes. Maybe, you know what? He made a mistake. He's got millions. He's lost his job, but maybe he don't care. Look, I contend, and this is where college basketball needs a guy like me. I contend that Huggins retired five years ago. He just didn't tell anybody. I don't think he just didn't tell anybody. I mean, he he hasn't done jack squat as a coach at West Virginia in 10 years. Yeah, they say they've got, you know, a bunch of good transfer players in. Eh. We'll see. Three times the legal limit. Get beer cans all over the place. I mean, what are you going to do? So it's not surprising. The ending ended as the career started, if you know what I'm saying. Debauchery at Cincinnati, stupidity at Cincinnati, debauchery and stupidity at West Virginia. It just took about 30 years in between, I guess, to get it all figured out. But I don't have any sympathy for him. I hope he gets help if he needs it. If he doesn't want help, don't get help. He's a big boy. I mean, I see all these people, well, I got to hope he gets help. I'm not a doctor. I don't know whether he needs help. Maybe he just got hammered one afternoon, one evening, and decided to blow a 2.0, three times the legal limit, throw some beer cans around, and just get hammered and go for a drive. I don't know. Everybody seems, oh, he's got a problem. Maybe he does, but I'm not a doctor. He's a big freaking boy. He's 69 years old for crying out loud. I agree with me here. Media going harder at Huggins DUI than the myriad of Biden crime family allegations. Well, they're allegations now. Well, he's a president. I mean, every allegation of every president in my lifetime has been met by crazy stuff, has been met by intense media scrutiny except for Biden. Hell, Huggins, maybe it's just the life he leads. He's lucky he didn't kill anybody. He's lucky he's not doing time. He, uh, excuse me. He's lucky he's not doing real jail time. He got very lucky being that hammered. He did. But maybe that's the life he wants. Apparently it is. He don't care. Maybe he likes chaos. My wife always said, my first and second, you like chaos. Somebody writes a nasty article on me. I don't care. I just make fun of it. I like chaos. I don't like that kind of chaos. And my goal in life is to never be behind bars. So far, so good. Maybe that's what he likes. I hear all these writers. These writers, I saw Dana O'Neill. Well, I hope, can you hope he, he gets the help that he wants? Or maybe that was Nicole Arbaugh. Uh, can you hope he gets the help that he wants uh, while being held accountable? Media wants everybody held accountable but their own damn selves. Everybody must be held accountable except themselves. Huggins is a bazillionaire. He's 69 years old. You think he's going to change? 
Think he's going to do a 40-day stretch in Betty Ford, come out a new man? Huggins likes boozing. He likes hanging out with the boys. He likes doing that. Nah, he ain't going to change. Hey, you, were, you got fired. You resigned. They, they let you down easy. A lot of people are now saying, oh, Huggins changed my life. Look at the picture of him hugging his player on the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every coach does that. And you stop. Stop it, stupid. So it ended as it started. And, you know, there will be some guys that will no longer come on this show, I'm sure, because of my take on Huggins, but I don't care. I'm so tired of the dirtbag college coach. Look it up, man. Damn near every college coach, including my friend Gene Cady, went on probation that is currently in the Basketball Hall of Fame, the Naismith Hall of Fame. I mean, it's ridiculous. My guy Bob Knight chokes a guy. Right? I mean, he should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Krzyzewski, if somebody said to me, if you ever had Krzyzewski on this show, what would you ask him? I would ask him, how'd you make the uh, Louis- Louisiana Times Biscay article go away where it documented all these players from all these places, mommies and daddies getting jobs and moving to Durham? I mean, honest to God, it's paid to cheat. It's paid to be a jackass. It's paid in college basketball for years and years and years. And you can call me whatever you want. I'm just telling you the way it is. So Huggins gone. We'll see a replacement. Look, my thing, uh, probably Mike Jarvis, who let his players go to strip joints, or Dave Bliss, who had a player murder another one. Those would be my two on the list of who West Virginia wants because West Virginia has no heart. West Virginia has no soul. West Virginia has no integrity. Period. Boom. That's it. Hey, speaking of being a dumbass, did you see this? John Morant gets in trouble. He gets 25-game suspension. There's a player for the Patriots named Jack Jones. So Jack Jones had called out and condemned, right? He had condemned John Morant for playing with guns. He had put out on Twitter how dumb it was for John Morant to play with guns. Oh, okay. John Morant playing with guns. Bad deal. 25-game suspension. All right. Well, guess what happened with old Jack Jones? Jack Jones walking into the airport, this guy right here, this, this, uh, what's the right word? Hall monitor of truth, justice. You can just go ahead and play the tweets. Uh, this guy gets busted in the airport with not one, but two guns. Let me guess. Oh man, I didn't know they were in there. Jack Jones was arrested at Logan Airport for carrying a loaded firearm, two firearms in his carry-on luggage. He was charged with two counts on five different Charges. This wasn't his first arrest. All right, go back to Jack Jones's tweet. We got it next. Dumb. This is Jack Jones telling John Moran, you letting social media and your pride ruin your real money. Put them guns down and run that money up. Make one of your homies sign up for security or concealed carry if you feel like you need it that bad. But you the breadwinner. You got to start acting like it. All right, then, Jack Jones. Go back to the other tweet. If you don't mind, the one from Dom, uh, Jack Jones, two firearms in his carry on luggage. You can't make this stuff up, you know, shut up and dribble. I don't know, man. I'm not a big fan of it. I have never been, but damn two care and his carry on. We're talking about a damn dude's carry on stuff. We're not talking about, oh, I put it in my luggage. He's got it on his backpack. Like a backpack would be a little heavier. Would it not? If you had two guns, I think it would. I do. I'll get back to Huggins in a minute. Here's a shocker. This is almost a cliche now, and I'm tired of it. I'll get to Wyndham uh, Clark in a minute. Here's a shocker. A wide receiver is being a pain in the ass. I could have had a V8. You're telling me a wide receiver is being a pain in the ass? Oh, my God. Say it ain't so. What are you talking about? No way. Stephon Diggs, we talked about him last week. A source close to the Bills locker room says the all-pro wide receiver is frustrated. Listen to this. With his role in the club's offense, they only threw him the ball 100 times, and his input in play caught. Hey, Stephon, I got to tell you, I don't want your dumb ass having any input in play caught. You're a moron. You're a child, obviously. You're very immature. You got traded from the Vikings for a reason because you're really stupid. Do yourself a favor, Stefan. Run patterns, catch the ball, hustle back, and do it again. That's it. I mean, that's it. It ain't that freaking hard. Here's another tweet. 
about this freaking genius. These geniuses, I got to tell you, wide receivers being pains in the backside, uh, I got, uh, there's nothing there. Stephon Diggs is frustrated with his role in the offense. He stormed out of the locker room following the playoff well, after being visually, visual, visually agitated at Josh Allen. Really? Okay, Stephon Diggs. Okay, ba- okay, baby. Yeah, baby. You dipstick. Just shut the lid. That's why I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I just want to win. You know I'm a competitor. No, you're not. No, you're about you. Period. You're just another in a long line of dumbass wide receivers that we got to put up with for a little bit. And if you're smart enough like Chad Ochocinco, you'll make it into some kind of, I don't know, and then you'll, we'll, you'll get older, you'll figure out what an idiot you are, and then you'll talk about making a comeback. We've seen this movie. It's like the ex-NFL linebacker. Hey, what are you doing now? Well, I'm in strength and conditioning at the local high school. We know the deal. We know how this ends. It's like the kid at Indiana basketball who's going to be a social media hero. We know how it ends. First round loss, fifth place finish, uh, cute guy on Twitter, cute guy. We know how certain things end. We just do. You guys act like we don't. We do. We've seen this before. Well, you're racist. Uh, Whatever. I judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin, period. Period. Don't at me. Tell you a good story over the weekend was the U.S. Open, and not just because we could all sit on our backsides as dads and watch in prime time. Give me prime time majors, baby. Give me majors on a Sunday night that end at 10, 11 o'clock. Holy my soli, my doli, my doli. Give it to me, baby. Give me that stuff, that funk, that sweet, that funky stuff. Give it to me. You got to give me that. Primetime golf in the majors is spectacular. And Wyndham Clark. All right, let's roll through the tweets here. This is spectacular. Wyndham Clark lost his mother to cancer a few years ago. Wyndham Clark's mother told him, be big. That's what I tell him. Uh, people that ask me about broadcasting, dominate the mic. His mother told him, hey, be big. His caddy was telling him, be an athlete. It's exactly what I tell my wife playing golf. I just felt like my mom was watching over me today. You're damn right. That's the emotion. And the emotion after the, uh, basically, mano y mano was fantastic. Uh, Ricky Fowler gained me as a fan. I always thought he was a child. They asked him what he told Wyndham Clark on the 18th green. Your mother, if she had been here, should be very proud of you. Ricky Fowler cut his hair. They showed him last year as the first alternate. He's got the dumbass, you know, little kid uh, mullet. He's looking like a clown. Now he looks like an adult male. Now he looks like Leonardo Caprio. Good for you, Ricky Fowler. Go get him. But back to Wyndham Clark. Wyndham Clark went mano y mano. Basically, every single shot was going to determine whether or not he got to do this. See, golfers face the most pressure. Basketball players, sure, you got to make some shots. Sure, you got to do it. There it is. Play big. You're an announcer, be big. You're on TV, be big. You're a radio host, dominate the mic. Be sitting there meekly. Don't be Raphael Davis. Well, I, I think we're gonna. Uh, I think Purdue's gonna be pretty good. I, I think Purdue. Shut up. Dominate the mic. Be interesting. You saw there. Be big. That's his mother's advice to him. His caddy's advice. Be an athlete. I tell Lee all the time. That was unathletic. I'll hit a ball decent, and she'll go, "What? Why are you complaining?" I, go, I wasn't athletic there. I didn't have athletic movement. I'm down six pounds this week for a variety of reasons, one of which is I've taken monster you-know-whats because I have changed my diet. Wyndham Clark had the longest odds of any golfer to win the U.S. Open since 2010. Uh, Did you listen to our show? Did you listen to Ryan Burr? Hey, Dylan, let's play a little Ryan Burr right now. Uh, I like Dustin Johnson from the Live Guys. And listen, the first two majors, if there are any indication – the live guys are going to be heard from in this major. So DJ's my live guy. I like the three Californians in in Homa, Cantley, and Shoffley. Um, my two kind of sleeper picks that you're going to get great value on. I like Tony Finau a lot. Uh, Finau generally plays really good on this kind of course. And then the guy you're going to get a great a great number on is Wyndham Clark, Dan. 
Wyndham Clark. He's the only player ever that was the player of the year in both the Pac-12 and the Big 12. Player of the year at Oklahoma State and then transferred to Oregon and was the player of the year there as well. Uh, so if you want to just take a stab in the dark and try to win a bunch of money, Wyndham Clark does everything well. Never been in this spot. So we'll see how he would handle it. But his game fits this track big time. That's why you watch this show. Look, I get it. There are more popular shows. I get it. There are shows on bigger platforms, but nobody has more fun and nobody gives you better information. Live golfers, 10% of the golfers in the field were live golfers. 16% of the golfers that made the cut were live golfers. 22% of the top 18 finishers were live golfers. And Ryan Burr knocked it out of the park. I'm putting $100. I got to drive downtown in the next couple of days and take some checks to the Indiana Sports Corp uh, for our uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, for our docket cycles for the city. And so one of them is going to be $100. I'm giving in the name of Ryan Burr because he was right, I was wrong. Dustin Johnson beat Kepka, and I should never, ever, 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 ever question Ryan Burr and neither should you. That was fantastic by Ryan Burr. That's why I have Ryan on. See, um, I like Michael Kim. If you get a chance to follow someone on Twitter, follow Michael Kim. He's a professional golfer. He's really good. I came upon him the other day at uh, just scrolling through Twitter. You know, they got that for you and following thing. Michael Kim is damn good. He's interesting. He's fun. He's funny. And he'll tell you exactly what it is. Now, people say watching golf is boring. It might be, but I got to tell you, a Sunday afternoon, I went to church. I uh, made lunch. I took the family. I did a bunch of stuff around the house. We went for a boat ride. I haven't drank in eight days and I haven't snacked in eight days. I came back. I uh, worked out like a crazy person, five miles on the elliptical, and it sat on my ass and watched golf. And it, ladies and gentlemen, was spectacular. Not kind of good, not sort of good, spectacular. You know, dumb people are always going to be dumb. I've always said, I know who I am. I pay attention. But this idiot, Karine Jean-Pierre, has a job for one reason and one reason only. She's a black lesbian or bisexual or trisexual. I don't know. Maybe she does whatever uh, feels good. But she is the press secretary. She's the press secretary that can't get things right ever. Like, she literally turned around a conversation about transgender athletes into how it's dangerous right now for trans. She can't get anything right. She's a diversity hire gone bad, as was Buddha Judge, as is all these people you see on ESPN. I'll get into that in a minute. But this is what she had to say about herself. Listen to this. A year in this role, there's been a couple of things that I that has made me incredibly proud. Many things, many things that made me incredibly proud to be at that podium uh, during this historic moment. Again, this is a historic administration. I'm a historic figure, and I certainly walk in history every day. But this is also a historic making administration because of this president. She is a historic figure because she has sex with women. All right. That's it? That's why? Uh, I don't know. I, that's it, right? Uh, is that it? I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, that's it. So I have sex with women, so I'm a historic figure. Uh, okay. Look, I'm the first white guy ever to wear red on Don't At Me. I'm historic. That's right. I'm the first bald guy to host Don't At Me. I'm historic. I'm the first guy to call a game uh, on the basketball tournament, TBT. I'm historic. I have sex with women, and I call games, and I called games on ESPN. I'm not historic. But I have sex with my wife, and I host Don't At Me. This is an historic moment in the history of streaming. I'm a white, heterosexual male. I'm the last of a dying breed. It's historic. Uh, stick it up your backside. I, you must celebrate me because I have sex with men and women. That's right, I do. And if you don't like me, 
then you need to go away. But you must honor me because who I sleep with, where my hands go. I have so many gross things I want to say right now. I have so many gross things. I do. All right, let's check in on Alex Stein. A week ago, Alex Stein, I guess, harassed by asking Brittany Griner a question. Of course, because Brittany Griner is an LGTQBEFGHIJKLMNOP and has sex with women and is actually married to women, we must care, we must dramatically care. The national nightmare is over. Brittany Griner, because of this video right here, gets the fly commercial. Oh, the humanity. Our car charter. Oh, the humanity. Go ahead. Do you still want to? Do you still want to boycott Stop. America, Brittany? Stop. Stop. Well, get off me. Stop. 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 I'm weird. Why? She hates Stop. America. Stop. Are you, what about the merchant of death, Brittany? Yeah, but I mean, honest to God, I had 12,000 morons chanting, we hate dockets, we hate dockets, hate crimes. That's a hate crime. It's a hate crime against a white male. Imagine if I was a lesbian. Imagine if I was an African-American lesbian. Imagine if I was the most important of all people, an African-American lesbian basketball player. Oh, the outrage at Michigan State. Michigan State would have had to cancel its season. But I'm just a bald white guy. In fact, I had luscious hair back then. So it doesn't make a bit of difference. But because of that, Brittany Griner had to, well, she gets to fly charter. Uh, Let's hear Clay Travis's thoughts. Thank goodness our long national nightmare is over. Brittany can fly private to keep her from having to interact with anyone in airports. The only people that she gets to interact with are the people at the freaking games. Oh, my God, who love her. Oh, yeah, thank God. Thank goodness. Yay, Brittany, bitch. (laughs) Oh, man. You know what? There he is. Brittany Griner's Erica's stupidity allowed a mass murderer to go free and continue killing. Who did worse, Brittany Griner or Bob Huggins? I've been getting crushed because I asked that question, right? Oh, you're a dumbass. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not saying I'm not a dumbass, but I'm asking a simple question. People lost their mind by me asking that question. See, here's the deal. See, Brittany Griner, by doing that, allowed a mass murder, one of the most dangerous men in all of the world to go because she's an idiot. And if you listen to her talk, seriously, she and Kaepernick should hang out together because they're both really stupid. Uh, You want her. You want to think she's smart. You want to listen to Kaepernick and think he has a brain. And then you watch the documentary you're like, oh, man, come on. Come on. Don't be that stupid. There's no substance here. Come on. But Brittany Griner was so stupid that she eventually, because, well, she's black, a WNBA player, uh, and a lesbian, she forced the United States government to give this guy up for her dumb ass. I don't know. That seems worse than Huggins driving around like Bob Huggins. That seems worse than Huggy on a Saturday night. Now, Huggins put people's lives in danger. Many people have had, including myself, their lives impacted by the actions of a drunk driver. But I got to tell you, you're stupid enough to get the merchant of death exchanged for you? Oh, it's a pest of my eyes. They are a burning. They are a burning. They are a burning. Um... John Morant apologized, and Stephen A. Smith isn't buying it. Now, we all have to care what Stephen A. Smith says, right? Look at this. John Morant is apologizing. Nobody buys what John Morant is saying. Nobody. There isn't a single human being that buys two things. Joe Biden talking about Father's Day and (laughs) John Morant apologizing for waving guns around. I mean, let's be honest. Nobody, and I mean nobody, believes either of those things. And when I say nobody, I mean nobody. So good for Stephen A. Smith. 
It's a little shocking in this day and age, but good for him. Good. Good for him. Boy, there's George Floyd. Look at, look at ESPN. George Floyd. <laughs> People celebrating. George Floyd. It's unbelievable. I've had time to reflect and realize how much hurt I've caused. I want to apologize to the NBA, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'm sorry for the harm I've caused. To the kids who look up to me, I'm sorry. For failing you as a role model, I promise I'm going to do better. To all my sponsors, I'm going to be a better representative. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pull this. It plays jingle bells. I'm lifting a cheek. George Floyd's a hero, ladies and gentlemen. Read about George Floyd before you make him a hero. But anyway, I digress. The Dodgers lost thousands of dollars. The Dodgers just went in the face of Catholics. The Dodgers went in the face of Christians. They did. Oh, the Players Association can kiss my ass. Whatever this Tamika trim, who cares? Good. I do think it's excessive, though. Excessive. I do. I do think that Moran, they're, they're losing like $8 million. What? What, what, what are we doing? Like, Bill Clinton's out there raping and hasn't gone to jail yet, and this guy has a gun in a video, and we're going $8 million? Are you out of your freaking mind? Of course it's excessive. It's stupid. But mess around, and you find out, I guess. The Dodgers are idiots. The Dodgers assault, uh, insulted me, you, and anybody that's a Christian. In fact, um, the Dodgers got what they deserve. Let's go to the video here of the Dodgers and the sisters of St. Stupid, uh, we hate Christians being celebrated at Dodger Stadium. That's the protest. I'm not going to stop here, and no amount of names that you could call me are going to matter. I've never seen Dodgers State. They did it an hour before. An hour before the game, first time they ever did it. These are the protests outside. And then an hour before the game, they honored the sisters of uh, Kiss My Ass, uh, a group that makes fun of us, Catholics, a group that makes fun of all of us, Christians. And the Dodgers, for some reason, gave in to the incredibly far-left Indianapolis star woke crowd that is so ridiculous, I can't even help you. There's nothing I can help you with that. Mark Schlereth is going to join us. I love Mark Schlereth. Stink. Radio host now in Denver. I saw some video of Russell Wilson. Did you see it? Why does everything with Russell Wilson seem contrived? Why does it? Everything with Russell Wilson. He's working out, he's sliding, he's doing push-ups. Everything seems to be contrived with this guy. I don't get it. We'll talk to Mark Schlereth about not only that, but the Nuggets winning the championship, the parade. Dudes are just hammered. You know I love it. We got stock up and stock down. I got Chad coming on later. We're going to continue talking about suspensions of John Moran. We're going to continue talking about uh, Huggies. Look. When you bring strippers into the freaking, into your locker room during kids' camp, eventually, your being an idiot is going to catch up to you. And it did the other day with Huggins. We'll be right back. Welcome into Outkick the Show. I am Clay Travis, your fearless leader. I am going to continue to argue that sports is one of the great unifying forces in all of American life. ESPN is a sinking ship. Democrats are now the party of the white, woke college graduate. We live in a land of participation trophies. You gotta lean into the turns. 
You really gotta lean into the turns. When Leah Thomas walked in that first day, it got silent and every girl was uncomfortable. Very difficult to go back to back years in the NFL with the number one overall pick. I've been out of LA long enough to have forgotten that libs, no matter how ridiculous the scenario, are gonna live. Another week of inflation, another week with Biden with COVID, and another set of losers to crown. People don't watch the WNBA on TV, in person, on a plane, on a train, on a bus, or on purpose. The scary thing, Tommy, is in the history of this government, I've never seen them give anything back that they've taken. Oh no, they never do. And they won't. We've seen coaches throw water bottles. We've seen coaches act like idiots. We've seen coaches slap other coaches. But I think if you're involved in carjacking, you're inherently a rotten human being. The level of stupid uh, that sometimes gets on our YouTube chat just gives me a headache. You're born a male, play with males. You're born a female, play with females. Don't at me about it, people. I believe this person is the greatest player anybody alive will ever see. How can you hate Derek Jeter? A guy's on base percentage tells me his batting eye, and a guy's slugging percentage tells me if he's a threat. That's the kind of guy that throws a no-hitter, that effectively wild guy. The great Mark Schlereth, you see him, you know him, you love him. Not only radio host in Denver, but you see him doing NFL games on Fox. All right, Denver's the happy place, and not just because Denver and Colorado were the first place to legalize weed, baby. Denver is the sports capital of the United States right now. Yeah, it, it really is, Dan. I got to tell you, um, man, I have just enjoyed the heck out of this run by the Nuggets. I've enjoyed you know, the, the quote unquote, what we like to think of as disrespect or lack of national coverage, you know, everybody picking against the Nuggets. Um, but the, the biggest thing that, that I've enjoyed more than anything else is I've enjoyed the connection. Like great teams have this connection. Great teams sacrifice for one another. Great teams, um, great teams basically put others first. And, you know, it's such a great lesson to learn. And for me, uh, as an as an analyst and as a former player, I never really was a fan. I, I just really haven't ever been a fan of just about anything. You know, I'm always watching a game, trying to figure out, hey, what am I going to talk about tomorrow on the radio show, this, that, and the other. And I immersed myself into the Nuggets. Uh, I immersed myself into being a fanboy, man. And I just enjoyed the heck out of the run. It's probably the first time I've ever done that. And... Um, and a lot of it was because I connected with the Nuggets based upon my championship teams. I saw the unselfishness. I saw guys uh, that didn't care if, you know, Nikola Jokic, not, it doesn't care. he gets three, three shots in the first half, and he, could, he couldn't care less. You know, one, one night uh, Aaron Gordon scoring 27, the next night he's scoring four. Doesn't care. Just going to do what he has to do to help his team win. And it was the first time since I was a boy growing up in Alaska rooting for the Steelers that I really felt like a fan again. It was a really, it, it was a really you know, cool journey for me. You know, uh, how much of that um, was, was Jokic? How much has Jokic resonated in the Denver community? It, it's been huge. You know, it's been huge. Just watching the way the guy plays, the unselfishness with which he plays, um, just the connection that he has. And he's just one of those dudes that's unintentionally really funny. You know, he just says things that because it's what's on his mind. And, you know, but he gets done with the he gets done winning the MVP of the NBA finals. And and his quote is work is done. Time to go home. You know, I mean, that's just, just like that's what <laughs> he's like the freaking Terminator. Um, and I think people have really embraced just kind of the realness like this isn't hey man, this is important. 
and, and playing is important and I love what I do, but it's not everything that I do and it's not the end of the world and it's not, you know, all that it's cracked up to be. So I, I think people just have, have, he's so authentic and so real that I think people have truly embraced that. And the other thing, Dan, and, and you know, there's been this battle between Stan Kroenke and the organization and the cable networks here. So there's a large portion of us who don't get to watch the regular season games. And I think this playoff run, people really fell in love with watching this team. And I tell you the other thing is you watch Jokic play. I know how skilled he is. I know what a great passer he is. I know how great court vision he has. I know, you know, he'll do whatever he has to do. But one thing I didn't really realize, the dude is an absolute physical beast. He just beats people up. I mean, just absolutely beats them up. We have this joke on my radio show, um, you know, because his brothers are both like close to seven foot and they're just monsters. And um, we have this version of Fight Club and it's called Circus Club. And you go to Circus Club and you knock on the door and they slide the little metal thing open. And uh, it's some big Russian guy back there. And the code to get in is if he dies, he dies. And then you walk in and you have to wrestle a bear. Like, that's the deal. That's why Jokic is always scratched up. He, like, his brothers have him wrestling bears after games. I and mean, it's just, it's been amazing. I, I've had so much fun watching it. You know, um, I'm Serbian. And my family ah. looks like Jokic's family. Like, you know, when I, my, my one cousin uh, was a professional wrestler. And it's like, I see the big face. I see the big head. I see the, I want to stay on parade. And it's just <laughs> spectacular. You know, you know yeah. what I mean? Spectacular. Yeah, yeah. It has been, it's, been a, it's been a blast to be a part of it. Let me let me go to uh, let me change directions on you. I said this earlier, and I want your take on this because I hope I'm wrong because I've always liked him. I'm seeing a video yesterday of Russell Wilson, your quarterback in Denver, and he's working out, and he's working hard, and he's doing all this stuff. But Mark, why do I feel like everything with Russell Wilson is contrived and staged? Am I so wrong about this? No, you're, you're not. Um, he hasn't. He honestly, I think he has an authenticity problem. And, you know, when you, when you're around in Seattle, man, they, um, there is like real disdain. Um, and it's the, it's the authenticity part, the look at me part, you know, look, yeah. And, and, and I get it, you know, I, I understand it. And we, we saw, it, you know, there was a, a part of it here this year, um, I call it his toxic positivity. You know, and, and you know this is a player, man. When yeah. you're playing, when you're playing poorly, man, you just got to own it. And you know, and sometimes you got to be like, I suck, and I'm gonna try. I'm gonna figure out a way to get this fixed, as opposed to let's ride. Everything's okay. We just got to keep believing, 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 believing. And you're like, dude, shut up already for the love of Pete, just shut up. Um, you know, I, I had, I had a meeting. Uh, I, I called the Broncos game this year, one of the games I called. And so I sat down with Russ and he had said to the media, you know, we all have to play better. You know, I have to play, but the whole team has to play better, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I sit down one-on-one -on -one with him and I said, all right, Russ, what do you have to do personally? You, as a player, what do you have to be better at? What do you have to, you know, change? And he said, well, you know, we get to the red zone. We just need to score more touchdowns. And, and I go, whoa, 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 da, 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 da. It's not what I asked you. It's not. I said, what do you? I don't want to know we. Right. You're not a French waiter. you like, I don't, I don't care about we, we, we. I want to know you, you, you. And he couldn't tell me. That's a problem. Like, that's a problem. Um, here's what I do know though. All right. This organizational structure was so piss poor that it is hard to operate an organization when the wrong people have authority and no fault of George Payton, but George Payton was given the authority within the organization as the general manager authority that, that frankly he shouldn't have because there was no ownership. Then the ownership group came in 
you know, spent the year trying to figure out and learn what it is to own in the NFL. And then they went out and hired an adult in Sean Payton. And I always say this about organizations and, and I, about coaches in general. Um, there are two types of fear that must be present within any organization. There is the biblical sense of fear, which is you, you read the Bible says the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not, oh, my gosh, he's going to strike me down. The fear of the Lord is awesome reverence and respect. You better have reverence and respect for the guy in charge, right? The other one is just straight up fear. He will cut my ass without even thinking about it if I don't do my job. So I'm calling a game in New Orleans. This is probably November-ish. And a uh, long-time employee walks up to me. I've known him forever. And just unsolicited, Danny says, you know, the problem with our team is Sean Payton walked out of the building and the fear walked out with him. There's no more fear in this organization. And you got to have it. Like I played, I played for one of the most regal people in the history of the National Football League, one of the most regal men I've ever been around, Joe Gibbs. He cuts you without even thinking about it. You know, and he loved you. And he, I mean, he, you knew the love and admiration he had for what you did. But he also, you also knew if I don't do my job, he will move. Yeah, he'll move on. And so anyhow, I, um, Mike Shanahan would cut you like Mike Shanahan would say, Hey, you're not playing well right now. So I'm going to cut you, but I'm really hungry. Let's go grab a pizza together. You want, you want, you like, he wouldn't even think about it. Like it didn't even, it didn't bother him. You're not playing good. You're done. I don't care. Um, and so you've got to have that with an organization. And that's just that alone will be one of the reasons Russell Wilson plays better. I've, I've had so many times and Sean and I, you know, I've, I've, I've uh, consulted for the Saints and Sean and I are good buddies. I've had so many times with him where, you know, just from a game planning standpoint and asking about how to put a game plan together and what you're doing. And he'll be the first to tell you, it's like, hey, man, a lot of people want to attack, you know, a defense's weakness. And how do we attack that? And, oh, man, this is a juicy matchup. we got to get to this. And he goes, my first rule of game planning is if, if I expose a weakness, then I have to move on. Even if that matchup is juicy, my first rule of game planning is I have to mitigate potential disaster. And a lot of coaches don't. They're like, hey, I know that the, our right tackle can't handle their you know, defensive end on the left side. But, man, if we could just hold up here, this is a touchdown. And what ends up happening? You may hit it once or twice. The next thing you know, it's a critical part of the game, and it's strip sack, fumble, touchdown the other way, and you lose by three. And you're like, what happened? Well, you didn't mitigate your own. Yeah, put a guy in a position to lose. Don't be surprised when he loses because you're the dumbass that put him there, Right. And and that's like he will manage Russell Wilson and he will know what Russell can do and what Russell can't do. And he's going to mitigate the things that he can't do. I got to get into something with you. Um, why are teams, in your opinion, and I guess this goes back to being a player. Why is Hard Knocks having such a hard time finding a team? I just think it's a, a giant pain in the ass. For the organizations, you know, I mean, you have to give access um, and, and it's a distraction, frankly. You know, I mean, I think about my own career and it's and it's different, obviously. Um, but there's a lot of us that, hey, man, I don't want to be a part of this. Right. I just want to do my job and move on. And, and I don't want to be a storyline. Um, and then there's part of your, your crew that can't wait for it to show up because they want to become stars, right? They want to have, you know, they want to quote unquote, build their brand. And I tell this to young kids all the time, like, like, you know, that are in the league, build your career and your brand will follow. Unfortunately, a lot of kids, you know, are more, more enthused about building a brand and the career suffers when you build the brand first. And so, you know, organizations understand that one, it's a pain in the ass. People are, have access to you that you don't want them to have. And then it will distract. There are some guys um, that it will distract just because you play a pro sport doesn't make you a professional. And there's, you know, on every football team, there's 
maybe half a dozen guys, maybe a dozen guys that aren't professionals. And they have to be influenced by the pros on the team. And, you know, and they have to kind of fall in line. And if you get enough on the outside of that line, you know this, uh, the gravitational pull, and I don't know why this is, I guess it's just human nature. The gravitational pull of the turds is exponentially more than that of the great guys and the, and the hard workers yeah. and the dudes that are pros. And so you put enough turds on your team. And um, I tell you what, it, it ruins, it'll ruin like a really talented team in a heartbeat. You know, it's funny. You've talked about a couple of things. Fear. I played for Coach Knight, coached with him 16 years. I was with him. And I tell people all the time, you can, you can whine about fear all you want, but fear works. I mean, you, yeah. I mean, I guess people think Coach Knight, you know. And the other thing is have a freaking adult in the room. Like, son of a bitch, you got to have an adult in the room. And the, that's a perfect way to describe Sean Payton. Let's have an adult in here that knows what right. the hell they're doing, that holds you accountable. Here's the other thing. Hey, to, your, to the point about hard knocks, when the Colts were the first one two years ago, I guess, to have it in season – Everybody talked about, oh, it's not blah, blah, blah. It's not a distraction. It's great. It's great for the brand. I said on my radio show, wait till next year when everybody finally tells the truth. And then they start right. talking about, yeah, you know, last year was a pain. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, sure. It's, it's funny, you know, like we get within our own facility, we get like there's hiding spots, you know, and like. Right. I know, like the 90, 98 season, we go, we start the season 13 and 0. And, you know, the, the regular contingent of your local media guys are in the locker room at their, at, when it's open locker room, you know, and it's, you know, it's half a dozen guys and it's like whatever, you know. By week 11, week 10, you're hiding in the training room, you're hiding in the weight room yes. because, like, like, there's 45 people in your locker room. You're like, oh, I can't, I mean, I, I can't even change. Uh, it just is like, it, it just drives you bananas. And there's no question every time you walk around. And plus, you know how it is in the locker room. I mean, there's a killer be killed kind of, um, you know, kind of verbal sparring that goes on in a locker room all the time. And especially in today's, you know, day and age, the common vernacular in a locker room is not fit for, you know, it's not fit for real, real life situations. And it's, it's part of what makes it fun. You know, we've got, we say things that just um, are inappropriate and, you know, and, and it's why we're so tight knit for, for, you know, in, in a lot of regards, but yeah, you, you, it, it ruins your personal space. You know, it's funny. We were talking about Sean Payton being an adult. I went into the Broncos and called the a game last year and, you know, we're back. They have us by the cafeterias where we meet with the players and coaches and everything. And so then they say, Hey man, you guys can go ahead and eat. So we go into the to the cafeteria to eat, and there's business personnel, people from the other side of the building, people that like people that were there when I played there that you never ever saw, right? And they're downstairs having lunch, entertaining clients, and bothering the players while they're trying to eat and have their personal space. And Sean Payton comes in here, he's not here for he's not here for like four weeks. Three weeks, he goes, well, that ain't happening anymore. Like, only essential <laughs> football personnel are allowed down here. You business people, you can pound sand. Bring a sack lunch. I don't give a crap, but you ain't coming down into our area. This is a sanctuary. It's for us. You know, because the players sitting there talking, you want to talk about game planning or you want to talk about whatever you're talking about, and all of a sudden there's there's kids and there's people there that want to take pictures. with it. it. It was, I mean, it's total bullshit. <laughs> he just comes in and goes, no, 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 no. This is not how this operates. This is not how this works. Um, and I, for one, look at that and go, good for you, finally. We've got somebody who understands how football operates. Hey, that's how everything should operate. That's, you know, that college is a little different now. you got to entertain those guys, the boosters, because of the NIL. But uh, it's amazing how people wouldn't understand that. People, well, what are you talking about? You know, they're your sponsors. You're supposed to take care of them. Yeah, maybe it's at a sponsor event, but not at a day when I'm in the middle of two a days or I'm just got done lifting my ass off here. Stop it. Get him right. out of here. Absolutely. Right. 100%. Uh, yeah. Jeez. Hey, thanks for coming on, man. I hope you'll come back. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. 
Anytime, Dan. Always good to see you, man. Glad you're doing well. And uh, yeah, anytime you need me, just hit me up. All right, brother. That's the great Mark Schlereth. That was as good a conversation as you're ever going to hear because Mark Schlereth is as smart a dude as you're ever going to hear. Super Bowl champ, toughest dude you'll ever meet. If you want something interesting, do yourself a favor. Google Mark Schlereth and look at all the things that he fought through. I give Mark credit because Mark doesn't go overboard ripping the softness of current athletes. I would be insane, right? I'd be out of my freaking mind, completely whacked out, completely nuts. Look, Last year, Indiana, or two years ago, Indianapolis was the first team that had hard, uh, hard knocks in the middle of the season. First thing I saw, teammates are tired of Darius Leonard. You couldn't have Darius Leonard around. Second thing I saw, Carson Wentz is an I, 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 me guy, I, I, he would drive you nuts. He was talking to Jonathan Taylor, and he was talking, I, me, I, 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 I. And Jonathan Taylor said, before he started in, he said, I already know. And if you've ever dealt with players, or actually people, if a pain in the backside starts talking about himself or his kids and the person he's talking to goes, yeah, I already know. Not even rude. You can, you can, and Jonathan Taylor wasn't rude. He said, I already know. That means shut up. I know. I don't want to hear it. Let me in on my own thing. That's it. Period. I was playing golf the other day. We're on the 18th hole. Uh, I thought I had to get up and down in two, but the other team crapped the bet. I said something to a guy we're playing against, and he goes into a soliloquy on his member guest on the 18th hole for all the money. I already knew. I just backed off, waited, walked around, and away we went. That's it. That's all. Serious business. I hope everybody had a great Father's Day. I hope everybody got out. I hope their kids called them. Uh, If you are somebody who doesn't like your father, for whatever the reason, if you are somebody that has a problem with your father, do yourself this favor. Do yourself this favor and call your dad even today. You won't regret. I swear to God, you will not regret it. You won't. There's nothing about it you'll regret. And anybody that tells you that fathers are important can kiss my backside. Uh, Honest to God. Fatherless crisis in the United States. Percentage of kids raised without fathers. Black children, 64%. Hispanic, 42%. White kids, 24%. Asian kids, 16%. If you don't think fathers are important, you're out of your freaking mind. 90% of runaway and homeless kids are fatherless. Now, Tony Dungy talked about this a while back and got crushed by the idiots. Fathers matter. I don't care what Greg Doyle or the people at the Indy Star or the legacy media is trying to tell you or politicians or the LGTBQ crowd or any of the idiots that you see. Fathers matter. 90% of runaway and homeless kids come from fatherless homes. 75% of all teenage murderers come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. 70% of kids being incarcerated come from fatherless homes. 60% of all rapists come from fatherless homes. Now, don't let anybody tell you differently. Don't let anybody, don't care whether or not some jackass gets all over Tony Dungy because he's a conservative and he says fathers matter. It's okay now to come out. It's okay to criticize naked dudes at LGTBQ. It's okay to come out and say, you know what, fathers matter. How ridiculous is that? Fathers matter a hell of a lot more than some dude waking up in the morning, putting on a bra, panties, and a uh, set of boobs, makeup, lipstick, and hair, and twerking in front of kids. So you can kiss my ass, every one of you, that says fathers don't matter. Or you can kiss my ass, every one of you, that says, hey, look, it's racist, sexist, misogynist to say that fathers matter. Good. Call me all of it. Call me absolutely all. Every single one of them. If you don't think fathers matter, you're an idiot. That's my message on Father's Day. That's what I got out of Father's Day. That's me. That may not be you, but that's me. All right, last thing. At least they admit it. Oscar voters, at least you admit it. At least now the Oscars. Let's show the tweet. The Oscar voters are pissed because Hollywood decided it doesn't matter how good 
your movie is, it doesn't matter even a little bit what your movie is about. What matters is how, quote, inclusive your movie is. Really? Oh, okay. Says whiny, rich Hollywood liberals will soon be complaining they're unemployed due to the Oscars' new inclusivity requirements. Now, here's what you got to understand. What you got to understand is the Oscars are saying you cannot be, you cannot be invited to win best movie unless you meet the requirements of diversity. What does that have to do with a movie? What does that have to do? Movie will not be considered for best picture nomination unless they feature a lead or significant supporting character from an unrepresented racial or ethnic group have a main storyline that focuses on an unrepresented group or at least 30% of the cast comes from two or more unrepresented groups, women, ethnic minorities, LGBT, or the disabled. At least they admit it. ESPN doesn't admit it. They don't admit it. But the only reason you see Brian Custer hosting a show or the guy Smith hosting a show, you tell me. Are they any good? Hell, the only reason you see certain white dudes hosting the show. At least they admit it. At least they say, hey, all right, there you go. At least they admit, like in college basketball, they just throw everything they can at diversity. Why do you think you see Jalen Rose, Stephen A. Smith, and Mike Wilbon, and not somebody with some actual basketball chops? Why do you think? At least they're admitting it. Why do you think you see a third-team all-Big East women's player on every day, lady named McNutt, talking about the NBA as opposed to Tim Legler? At least they admit it, Hollywood does. Seriously. I mean, look, hire the best people, black, white, anybody. But at least admit when you're doing what Hollywood's doing, ESPN and other networks. We know. We know. You think Will Bond and Stephen A. Smith are the best to break down a game? Come on, please. You think that Sarah Spain went from being uh, an update person on WMVP in Chicago to hosting a radio show because of her immense talent? Please. At least they admit it. Uh, We'll be right back. I got some stock up and stock down I got to get to. I got a lot to get to, people. Please, just admit it. No big deal. Nobody, I don't care. People get all mad about commercials. I don't care who's in commercials. Uh, Don't bother me. I mean, but when I got taken off of a, myself and Scott Johnson, the best director at ESPN, got taken off the ACC tournament a couple years ago for diversity hires, just admit it. Ain't no big deal. One dude had never done an ACC game. The other guy, Corey Alexander, should have taken my place. He should have. He ACC legend. Just admit it. No biggie. We'll be right back. I, mean, I just think the way Anthony Bass handled this was so sloppy. Oh, I think it's and, perfect. And I mean, what he reposted he, he did and then every, how he, did he, he bent the knee and bowed. He was going to catch the ceremonial first pitch. And, and after that was announced, then they assigned him to the minors. Yeah, that's the problem, though. He should have never done that. Don't apologize. Don't well, bend the knee. Well, but then, uh, then it would just be sloppy. He'd be sent down anyway. But it's not. But But after doing that, he had the general manager on the record saying he would not be disciplined and that he was apologetic and accountable. Look, if you're going to put that. And then a guy came up the 60 day DL. If it's demonic and evil to mark it that way, that's very different. Go back and read what Trevor Williams and Clayton Kershaw said. That's where the big difference lies to begin with. Very different speech from those guys. Anthony Bass also, if he truly believes it's demonic and evil, then stand by it because the moment you apologized, you open yourself up to the booze you got the next night. That happened. If you believe this firmly in it, you ended up cut anyways. So instead of being looking like a huge jerk and having to go out and catch the, the, the pitch on pride night and be forced to apologize and stumble through an apology while saying, I fully believe in the post, but I also see I could be seen as hateful, so I apologize for that, but I don't apologize for this. Oh, by the way, Anthony, you're cut. Get your ass to AAA. He could have cut all that out and said, no, I stand by what I said. 
I, I'm entitled to my rights and my opinions, just like anyone else who has an opinion on the other side. He could have gotten cut the same way, but we could have skipped all this stuff. Well, Meanwhile, Trevor Williams and Clayton Kershaw handled it in a much smarter way than he did, and I think they were much more effective in making their point than Anthony Bass. But Hey, West Virginia, don't come crawling back to me. No, no, no. No integrity, no dockage. Go ahead and hire yourself, Dave Bliss. Go get Calvin Sampson to come over. Uh, Chris Beard available, somebody that, you know, hits their girlfriend. I mean, let me know. Dave Bliss, all he did was captain the ship of, ship of a couple murders. I mean, that or a murder. Don't come crawling back to me, West Virginia. No, 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 no. No, I got to tell you. I've had enough of you. So Bob Huggins is out. I said this a little bit earlier. So Huggins is out for a DUI, 0.21, which is basically three times over the legal limit. 0.20, you are at risk of dying, I read the other day. I don't know. Maybe Huggins likes this life. Maybe this is the life Huggins wants. He's a bazillionaire. He lives in Morgantown, likes apparently to drink beer and hang out and eat. I mean, maybe that's the life he lives. So people are saying, well, you know. He's got to get help. Help. Look, who wants to die uh, in a nursing home sober? I'd rather die in a pile of blow with some, never mind. I'm just totally kidding. But maybe Huggins likes the life. You know, he's 69 years old. Am I, I'm going to go to the YouTube chat on this. Am I wrong about this? The dude is 69 years old. I hear all these writers, well, I hope he gets the, the help that he wants. I, I worry about, I don't worry about him at all. Dude, 69 years old, 69 years old, you're a grown-ass man. Make your own grown-ass decisions. If your grown-ass decision is you want to drink beer, sit around for the rest of your life, count your money, maybe do some fishing, great. If your grown-ass decision is, you know what, I'm a fat slob that drives around drunk and I want to maybe help people, so I'm going to get sober and I am going to help others, then great. But you're 69 damn years old. You're 69 years old. Figure it the frick out. But I'm certainly not going to sit here and say, well, Bob Huggins needs help. Remember the basketball media here in the United States. The basketball media is now doctors. They're not psychiatrists. They're not psychologists. Huggins needs help. Remember when they were epidemiologists, when they knew everything about COVID, or when they were economists and they knew everything about the free market? Truth of the matter is there isn't one person in the basketball media other than Fran, Seth, and anybody that's coached that knows their backside from third base. Let's just be honest. We all know. The dude blew a 2.1, three times the Pennsylvania limit, empty beer cans in a trash bag. At least he's, he doesn't litter. He was in Pittsburgh but thought he was in Columbus. Ah, Freudian slip. Same town, really, except the bridge when you come under into Pittsburgh is fantastic. Now, some dude's like, well, he went across state lines to get to Pittsburgh. Uh, he was in Pennsylvania. I don't even know what the state lines would be, but who cares? Look, put his ass, do what he's got to do, put his ass in jail uh, for a day or whatever you got to do, and then figure it out, Huggins. Yes, I agree. Coaches at this level are paid to act responsibly. He didn't. Now he's out in 70. I don't see any way back for him, but I've been wrong before. Look, why come back? The dude has been retired. I had more than one. I, I had more than one ESPN analyst say, look, Huggins has been retired. For five freaking years, he just hadn't told anybody. And you're spot on about Huggins. Look, the dude had strippers in his locker room when he was hosting a kids camp in Cincinnati. I'll, I, mean, I wasn't there, but I had a ton of high school coaches tell me this. So kids would go to sleep. Coaches go down the locker room. Maybe it was the last day. I don't know. But strippers come in the locker room. Yay, Rock, go fight, win. I always liked him. I never really respected him because of that. And I get it. There are a lot of coaches out there that are saying, oh, this is great. I feel so sad. Oh, my God, it's terrible. Huggy saved my life. Yeah, great. That's fine. I'm just telling you how I 
go about it. Remember this, ladies and gentlemen. Remember this. Get fired for anything except losing. You can be a homophobe. You can be a drunk. You can be a degenerate. You can be a cheat. You can have guys murdered. Dave Bliss got another coaching job. You can get two schools on probation like Calvin Sams. It don't matter. You can get fired for hitting your girlfriend, wife, allegedly. It don't matter. If you've won, you'll always get another job. Just, you know what? Pay attention to it. That's not mine. That's not mine. Bob Knight used to run the rehab program for coaches. We had Tate Slock. Uh, Don Donaher didn't need his most honest guy ever, but he got fired, and Knight brought him over as an assistant coach, and Don was great. Tate Slock had been fired. He came over. Norm Ellenberger had been fired. He came over. We used to run a halfway house for coaches. We did. And it's kind of fun to be around the guys. Hey, how about this? You think this guy will lose a scholarship? Or do you think he'll get more money for a scholarship? An Oregon State football player. Listen to this. An Oregon State football player. Oh, man. He's committed. He's charged with attempted murder. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Attempted murder. Now, I got to tell you, in the current state of sports, do you think he'll be kicked off? Do you think, I mean, do you? I mean, we got to make sure that we kiss the backside of every little kid. I mean, we got to make sure. Or else, you know, you're racist, you're sexist, you're whatever. I'm going to read you the story here. It's kind of fascinating. Uh, Santa Barbara, college running back, Brandon Smith, he committed back on June 2nd. Dude's from Chicago. Three hours after... Deputies responded to a report of a fight near a community pool and found a 20-year-old man with serious injuries. The victim was taken to the hospital. He's expected to survive. Smith was one of four people arrested and related to the fight, and all four suspects were charged with attempted murder, robbery, and conspiracy. They don't believe this is a random attack. The suspects and the victim are known to each other. Smith's got a $2 million bond. There you go. Oregon State rescinded the scholarship. Hey, if the dude gets out, that just means Fresno can go take a swig, right? Look, if you think I have no, I don't know the right word. If you think I have uh, no faith in the current generation of coaches, you ain't, wrong. you ain't wrong, baby. You ain't wrong. You're not. I'm sorry. You're just not. Uh, Matt Fitzpatrick, see, all right, U.S. Open. U.S. Open happened. And Wyndham Clark wins. And Wyndham Clark was given to you on this show to win some money. All right. Well, Matt Fitzpatrick, the defending U.S. Open champ, didn't like the course. You know what? Here's the deal. Nobody, and I mean nobody, and I think I speak for all of you. Let me know. I'm on the YouTube chat right now. I don't think anybody, anybody, gives a rat's ass about players not liking the course. Details. On L.A. Country Club tickets, 23000 for sale. 14 of those were for hospitality. 9000 general admission. These are the people that bring the energy to the atmosphere. It's just shockingly low, the corporate open. $250,000 initiation to join this place. you got to wear pants when you play. You can't wear shorts. You can't bring your phone. If you talk on the phone, you got to do it in a cubicle. Hey, look, you L.A. Country Club members, come on over to Old Oakland. I got a game this afternoon at about, oh, I don't know, 240. I need two players. My buddy Cam and I are going to have a go. He gets too many strokes, but I'm going to be out there playing. I mean, what can I tell you? Here's Matt Fitzpatrick. Nobody cares about rich, young dudes whining about a golf course. Very poor. It's disappointing on the UGA side. They want a great tournament. That's what I've heard a lot of members bought tickets, and that's why there's so less people. Hopefully it's not the same for other U.S. Opens going forward. You know, players like, they do, players like crowds. Players, good players, great players, like showing off. The only reason I became a really good basketball player is because I worked at it. And why did I work at it? I wanted to get girls. I wanted Gretchen Wellman to come over. I wanted Sheila Healy to stop by. I wanted Sue Graham to say hello, Karen Yoakum to date me. You know what I'm saying? We all know. People like crowds. 
People enjoy crowds. We want crowds if you are an athlete. You're a show-off. You're a showboat. You're one of those guys. So I don't blame Matt Fitzpatrick for complaining about that, but they also got into the course. The course looked fine. I mean, after the first day, let's be honest. Let's be honest. After the first day, course was pretty good. All right, David Freeze of the Cardinals. Remember David Freeze, home runs in a playoff series? David Freeze became a legend. It was his hometown team, the Cardinals. David Freeze uh, had a good career. David Freeze showed himself to be a pretty clutch player. You know, people get mad. Uh, well, you know, he had a great, I don't know, series. Yeah, he did. He had a great series. Okay. I mean, I would like to have a great series. I think we would all like to have a great series. So in 2011, David Freeze drove in four runs in game four, forced the fifth game in the NL. CS. He had a 545 batting average. He had three home runs, blah, 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 blah. Um, David Freeze, bottom of the ninth, 2011 World Series, Texas leading 7 to 5. Freeze, two out, two men on, two run triple. I remember it like it was yesterday. Baseball was popping that night. Boom, 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 boom. Game seven, Freeze, two run double. 21 RBIs, a Major League Baseball record in the World Series. He was MVP. He was the sixth player to win the uh, LCS and World Series MVP. He won the Babe Ruth Award. It's a postseason MVP, not surprising. So David Freeze is a guy that they put in the Hall of Fame for the Cardinals. David Freeze basically said, look, look, I ain't good. 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13. I played five years. Had a great run in 11. But that's it. I looked at who was, who I was during my tenure, and that weighs heavily. I mean, I feel strongly about my decision. I understand how people might feel about this. That's David Freeze declining in their induction into the St. Louis Cardinals Hall of Fame. Felt he wasn't good enough. Felt he didn't measure up. It's pretty interesting. Most guys whine and moan. In fact, I've never, I got people telling me I am the Barry Bonds of the Indiana high school, or in the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. And I'm like, you know, I never thought about it. And then Greg Doyle wrote an article saying how nobody will nominate me, which is a complete lie. But, hey, look, I can't help people lying about me. Dave Pitchker, my high school baseball coach, did. But anyway, I never think about it. I don't. And you probably don't either. And good for David Freeze. I mean, if truth be told, I should be, in the, I should be a charter member of the Indiana Broadcasting Hall of Fame. Certainly should be in the Indiana University Hall of Fame for my service. Certainly, ladies and gentlemen, should be in the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. But I would, I would say no to all of them. <laughs> this is crazy. It's almost more of an ego move rejecting the Hall of Fame vote. And like he said, he waited all the way till he got nominated. No one outside of St. Louis would have known about it. And now everyone knows about it. I don't know what to think about this. Well, who cares what you think about it? And you know I love the stool president. You know I love him. But I got to tell you, it doesn't matter. No matter what anybody thinks about it. Nothing matters what anybody thinks about it. It's what David Freeze thinks about it. And good for David Freeze. Really. All right, we got some stock up and stock down because it's Monday and I, ladies and gentlemen, are wearing red. See, Tiger wears red on Sundays. I wear red on Monday. I'm going to start a new tradition. I'm going to wear red on Monday and a don't at me shirt on Friday. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, that's going to bump up ratings. Yeah, that's going to matter. You're damn right it is. Uh, No, I am not going back to West Virginia. West Virginia does not have enough money. When you average three points a game, Ruel, at Indiana, you should be in the Hall of Fame. (laughs) Oh, by the way, Stock, I'll go to stock down in a minute. Stock up. Stock up, Lou Williams. Hey, happy retirement, Lou Williams. Six man of the year three times. Most 30-point games off the bench. 40-point games most off the bench. Most 20 and 10 assists off the bench. Most 30 and 10 assists off the bench. Most assists off the bench. 
Top six man all time. That's crap. John Havlicek was. I don't care what anybody says. But statistically, Lou Williams is the numero uno six man of the year. And I got to tell you, Lou Williams is one of those guys, just one of those guys, one of the last of a dying breed, drafted out of high school. A lot of you didn't know Lou Williams because Lou Williams didn't go to college. Nobody ever knew who he was. He was a 45th pick of the NBA draft. Now think about this just for a second. He was drafted in the 2005 NBA draft. He has played the most games off of the bench in the history of the NBA. Del Curry was the previous one. God bless you, man. Good for him. It is rare, it is rare that anybody plays as long as Lou Williams. It is rare in this day and age that anybody, anybody, is satisfied with the role Lou Williams had. I'm just telling you. 13,396 points off the bench. Damn good. He runs a basketball camp in his hometown. This isn't a Jay Billis basketball camp where you charge guys three or $400. This is a basketball camp for kids. This is a Dan Dockage basketball camp where you have one at your high school in Maryville, Indiana for 24 years. Yeah, I'm promoting myself. Uh, you have one for 24 years, and I think I raised the price twice. I think it went from 50 to 70 to 90. What are you doing? Uh, yeah. Eh. This, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I saw this last night in the rundown, and I'm going to say stock up to Austin Simmons. He's a high school quarterback. He's skipping two years to enroll at Ole Miss, but I do it with trepidation. Dude has a 5.3 grade point average. Dude is really good. Now, here's the deal with a 5.3. You know my story about Harvard calling me in high school. Dan, this is Joey Bagadona, assistant coach at Harvard. I see you sent us our questionnaire back. Yeah, says young pimply-faced Dan. Yeah. Uh, I love Harvard. You kidding me? Well, I thought you were going to Indiana. Well, I mean, it's Harvard. I mean, come on. If I can go to Harvard, that's a little different. I understand that I got a full life ahead of me after basketball, and that's one of the reasons I'm going to Indiana, but this is Harvard. Oh, man, Dan, that's great. Hey, says here you have like a 4.8 grade point average. Yeah, your high school's pretty good, huh? Yeah, yeah, Andran's pretty good. You know, it's a small Catholic school, and uh, I do have a 4.8. Oh, man, that's great. You in any clubs? I go, no, I got to tell you, I, I, you know, I was in the play. Uh, I participate in the pep rallies, me and Jimmy Bullock, uh, who are the other, you know, and, hey, Dan, that's great. Hey, uh, wait a second, Mr. Joey Bagadones. I got to tell you something. That 4.8 I got, that's on a six-point scale. Now, does that make any different difference? What? <laughs> oh, no, Dan, I think we should be fine. Hey, look, I will call you back in the next couple weeks. It's great talking to you. I hope that 5.3 is on a four-point scale. As soon as I saw it, I thought to myself, now, wait a second here, people. Time out. Time out. Time out. Is this on a four-point scale? I think it is. I don't know why Andrean had a six-point scale. I honestly don't. It's kind of amazing, but I, I don't, you know, I honestly don't know why. But they did, and Harvard hung up. So I'm going to assume. But Austin, baby, why are you trying to grow up so fast? You're trying to get that money, ain't you? You're trying to get that bankroll. You're trying to get that cabbage. You're trying to get that scratch. What are you doing? Like, stock up to you for being a good enough dude that you can do this. But let's be honest. What the hell are you doing? Like, why would you want to leave high school two years early, particularly when you are the football star and the baseball star? That seems dumb to me. But what do I know? Hey, out there, stock up Father's Day. Stock up Lee Ross, Tegan Shaw. Jared Shaw, Laura Dockett, Andrew Dockett, my entire family. So Saturday night, I hadn't seen my mother in a long time, so we drove up to Merrillville, took her out to dinner, she and her friend Ted. Yeah, it was a nice Saturday night. Two-hour drive, we drove back, Lee and I. Had a nice chat on the way. Listen to the PGA on radio, which is fan-freaking-tastic. It's awesome, the PGA. So we did that, and then on Sunday, I woke up, I got it going a little bit, you know. 
The next thing you know, I had a little breakfast. Lee and I went over here to St. Simon's. Uh, the, the priest threw a nice hour-long mass, went back, grabbed a little something to eat. Then I went over here to uh, Old Oakland, got myself five miles in on the elliptical because QC Kinetics has made my left knee feel great. And Affinity Whole Health gives me testosterone shots. My back's a little hairy, but what are you going to do? Then we got on the boat. We put a cooler together. Kids had some high noons and some lining kugels. I had some A&W diet. We took a little tour around the lake for a couple hours. Came back. Lee made ribs. Uh, they were cooking. We came into a beautifully smelling house. Next thing you know, had some ribs. Sat on my fat ass at about 5 o'clock till 11 watching golf. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a Father's Day. I want to hear about your Father's Day ASAP. Because I love Father's Day. Jared and Tegan gave me a nice card. Lee, a wonderful card. My daughter, my son and daughter called. My son, no card, no gift. What? Laura got me golf balls. Anyway, great Father's Day. Great, 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 great Father's Day. Keith, I got to lose more weight. I do. Affinity Whole Health has helped me, but it's on me. I had a bad day yesterday in terms of weight loss, but I'm still down five for the week. I am not messing around. All right. Stock down Bob Huggins. Look, I'm not going to say you're sick. I'm going to say you're stupid. I'm going to say you've always been stupid. I'm going to say bringing strippers into your kids' camp back at University of Cincinnati, you're an idiot. I'll give you this. You cover it nice. Coaches love you. Uh, high school coaches in Ohio really love you. They used to kiss their wife goodbye and spend two weeks at Huggies camp. Because then he had the DUI bus. That's what he called it, allegedly. The DUI bus would take you to uh, the bars in Covington, which were on the river at the time, the TGI Fridays, Collingsworth had a place, and they'd bring you back. Smart. That's smart. But when I was in Indiana, a high school coach would be like, hey, look, Huggins' camp is that week. We can't work your camp in Indiana. Tell Coach Knight I said hello. I'm like, hey, I know. So Huggies started his career that way and ends it in a puddle. Got a shredded tire at .21 uh, alcohol content and ends up getting arrested. I feel bad for Huggins. I feel bad for his family because families deal with this. Uh, uh, it's not good. Huggins has an opportunity here, though. Everybody knew what he was. Everybody knew he was a cheat. I told the story a long time ago about $10,000, him and Brett Barrett, the deceased Brett Barrett, trying to get a kid named Keith McLeod to not come to uh, Bowling Green, to go to Maine Central Institute. And they had $10,000 to pay his entry fee. And I called him on it. And like every bully, which is all Huggins was, uh, he backed down. Next thing you know, I'm speaking at his uh, clinic. He's speaking at my tip-off dinner. That's what men do. But Huggins ended up the way he was going to end up. He was always going to end up that way. See, this is why you need a guy like me in the Charles Barkley role for college basketball. Because everybody, oh, Huggy this. Huggy. No, 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 no. Never won a conference championship in a major conference. A mess of a human being with two DUIs now in coaching. Uh, allegations of cheating all over. Not necessarily at West Virginia, I don't think, but certainly at Cincinnati. A mess. But, hey, won a lot of games, kissed a lot of ass, and everybody loved it. I can't, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I'm tired of these two people. Spotify said goodbye, Meghan Markle, who was so freaking hot in suits. I mean to tell you, Meghan Markle was so freaking hot in suits. I cannot even think straight. It's the first time I ever saw her. I'm like, who's this? Next thing you know, she's married to Harry. Now, you got to give Harry a little bit of credit. Pre-Mary and Mar Meghan Markle, Harry was in the military. I support anybody who was in the military. But I also got to tell you, he seems like an egocentric, brand-driven clown right now. So what happened was Spotify said, no, we're out. And Bill Simmons called them like bad word grifters. They, they got like $100 million. They got an incredible amount of money from Spotify. And they literally provided no content. They didn't provide any content. I get like 800 bucks from a company and I'm contenting my ass off. Because that's what decent human beings do. These two are entitled pains in the prick. They are. I'm sorry. These two think the world runs around them. 
I'm sorry. But the Spotify deal is done. They're over, over, over. They signed it for $20 million, excuse me, back in 2020. They promised audiences different perspective, interviews with amazing people. They actually haven't done anything. Uh, one of them, Markle, chatted about with C- Serena Williams about ambition and unpacked Diva with Mariah Carey Singleton with Mindy Kaling. That's it. They won some award because, well, everybody gives these clowns award. And now they go. Uh, the Los Angeles Country Club. I got to tell you. Good for the Los Angeles Country Club and the Los Angeles Country Club people that, you know, snobbery matters and, you know, good for them. But the course actually stood up. It did. It did. It did. You can get mad, but it stood up a little bit. It did. It it, it got better. It it did. It it got better. It got harder. You can see it's probably pretty fun. But this is one of the world's most exclusive country clubs. $250,000 to $300,000 to enter. Um, It refused entry to Bing Crosby, Groucho Marx, and Hugh Hefner. Yeah. It did. Now, Hef's place is on the 14th tee. All right. You know, I don't know what to tell you. It, Groucho Marx once said, I would never belong to a club that wouldn't have me. Listen to this. A clothing after 6 p.m., men must wear a jacket in most areas of the clubhouse unless otherwise specified for an event. Denim of any kind is not permitted. Men's shirts must have sleeves, collars, be tucked in, while women's skirts can be no shorter than four inches above the knee. Cell phones aren't permitted inside the clubhouse. Calls can be made in a specially allotted phone room or in phone booths in a locker room while discreet use in silent mode is allowed in locker rooms, parking lots, and closed-door meetings on business club. Any posting any trace of the club at all on social media, photographs, comments, and even discussion of the membership is prohibited. In one way, I kind of dig it. I kind of dig it. Not going to lie. In a little bit of a way, I kind of dig it. Here's the deal. I kind of dig the fact that, you know what? Put your phone away. Put your phone away. Just put your damn phone away. You don't need your phone. Get rid of it. Go here. You play golf. You have dinner. You meet people. You talk. All right? I couldn't do the no denim. I have not wore a pair of slacks in I don't know how long. I'm old enough now. If I go to a speaking engagement, I wear my blue sport coat and my dark jeans. An open collared shirt. That's right. Gave a speech uh, a few days ago and at a, a CEO thing last Tuesday. And open collared shirt. You know, I'm, that, I'm of that age. When you're younger and you're trying to impress, but now I'm of the age. I don't know that I want to wear a sport coat, but I certainly don't want to wear pants when I'm playing golf. Anyway, there you go. Did you know the sex reassignment surgery market size is a $1.9 billion industry? You want to see why so many are pushing it? All you got to do, all you got to do is see that right there. $1.6 billion, and it's expected to go up 11.3% over the next five, seven years. There you go. What can I tell you? That's why we, we are seeing what we are seeing. It's a moneymaker, people, to get, you bit, to get your tits cut off. It's a moneymaker to get your PP cut off. They'll make some money doing that. Uh, speaking of making money, Chad Withrow is going to join us coming up, uh, coming up here soon. Very, very, very soon. Yeah. Can't wait to talk to him. I want to get into some things. John Moran, he lives in Tennessee. Did you know Memphis is actually in Tennessee? I don't think many people knew that. I also want to get into the U.S. Open. Look, I am a snob on two things. I'm not going to lie to you. I am a hotel snob. I've slept in enough flea bag dumps. In fact, I once slept in a place with plastic sheets. I did. So I'm a snob on that, and I'm a coffee snob. I am. Only two things I'm snobby about. Let me back. Chad Withrow next. What were the executives thinking when they were doing this? And then, of course, after the fact, we had a video surface of uh, a marketing executive saying that Bud Light wanted to move away from the fratty appearance of just college kids and men. And I mean, that almost made it worse. 
when you're behind closed doors, when you're talking to plant managers, when you're having meetings, when you're with the team, was there an acknowledgement of any of this, an acknowledgement of the situation, the boycott, and then the doubling down about moving away from the fratty image? What were those conversations like when all this started to kick off? So uh, everybody was upset, uh, including management. So we, every brewery has a plant manager that answers to corporate. And there seems to be a separation there because what corporate's doing is not reflective of what even the plant managers want. Um, and they themselves, we, we would have these meetings and it, it, nobody's happy about it. Everybody thinks it was a very bad idea, obviously. And, you know, the sales and, and everything shows that. So, um, I mean, they express the fact that they they were shocked. Why would they do this? What, what what were they thinking? Especially now, this is the worst. It's like the worst timing yet. The best timing if a company were to try to change the way it, it operates um, from a corporate level. So that, and that's just my opinion. And many of us are talking about that. Like, a, like, like they planned it in a way, uh, like a strategic uh, destruction of Bud Light. Okay, let's get into that because that's very interesting to me to hear. Now, we know that Anheuser-Busch has been bought by InBev, which owns a lot of brands, a lot of companies, has a lot under the umbrella. And that's when things kind of started to shift in a little bit more woke way. But you're telling me that you think that Bud Light knew this Dylan Mulvaney partnership was going to be a disaster, watched it become a disaster, and then almost sat back and let it happen? All right, the great Chad Withrow, fresh off of a Father's Day where he got to coach youth women's young ladies, girls, softball. So you know he is fresh and ready to go. John Moran's suspension came down. What are your thoughts? Fresh as a daisy over here, Dan. Uh, I love sharing some uh, old you know, youth girls sports coaching stories with you there during the break. Uh, John Morant could use a little discipline. I think my 8U team could use a little discipline this weekend, too, based on our showing. So I'm probably not the one to speak on this, even though I do my best as the coach to, to discipline the players. Um, I, I thought he got off pretty light, honestly. And I, I'm kind of nitpicking here because all along I thought it was going to be at least half a season. So we're talking about 15, 16 more games. Um, I thought that Adam Silver, he had every opportunity – to really lay the law down with John Moran if he wanted to and send a message to the rest of the league and be very heavy-handed. I don't know if you know a full season would have been that fair for John Morant, but it could have sent the message to the rest of the league, hey, don't lie to me and don't embarrass me and don't embarrass this league again when I let you off easy the first time and you tell me you're going to change and then a few weeks later you don't change. That could have been the message sent from Silver, but instead he goes with 25 games. It's significant for this reason, financially. He's going to miss $7 million during that suspension. And because of the eight-game suspension, because of the all, all the issues this past year, he missed out on the All-NBA team. And with that came an automatic $36 million escalation in his contract to make it a super max deal. So that is not insignificant. We're talking about $43 million over the last season and now season and a half that he's going to be missing out on. I like that they laid out some stipulations he has to meet in order to rejoin the Grizzlies, and it's not just, hey, 25 games and do nothing. I don't know what all that entails, but the bottom line is, Dan, and we I've talked about this with you, it's up to John Morant. I mean, the league can only do so much. If you don't want to help yourself and you don't want to start making better decisions and you think what you're doing is cool because it's in with the culture, the trend, whatever you want to portray it as, then you're never going to change, and this guy's going to be out a lot more money than just that $7 million he's missing with those first 25 games this year. So if John ja Morant decides that he wants to get better and he wants to make better decisions, he's going to go on and have a great career. If not, it's about to end very quickly. I think the financial hit was monstrous. Like, you know, I don't know what you got to do in the uh, – what do you got to do in the real world to take that kind of hit? Like, you got to be like Gordon Gecko, or you got to be like, 
You know, I, I, I don't know. The, the hit was incredible to me. I do like that there's stipulations. 25 games, that's fine, but the hit, honest to God, what do you got to do in the real world to get hit with that kind of fine? You know what I'm saying? I feel like you just have to have Monopoly money. You know, you mentioned Gordon Gecko, like guys who yeah. are uh, own private equity firms and, and that, uh, you know, are raising capital all the time. They're investing so much in the stock market that you could have a $15 million loss day. And it's while that's a big hit for them, even, it's not huge in the grand scheme of things because they might, they might make $20 million back the next day. When you're dealing with that level of, uh, of a hedge fund, if you're a hedge fund manager and you've got that much invested in it, I feel like that's the only way that you really lose it. But, Dan, it is different because all of that just feels like it's not real, right? If you're invested in markets and you're looking at stock prices and everything else, it's not physical money you can see out in front of you right there that's evaporating. It's a number on a spreadsheet or a number in a computer that because of stock price falling, you lost in a day, but knowing they can get it back. You're right about this with John ja Morant. That is an enormous number that he is looking at saying, here was my past earning potential that evaporated with a league investigation at me pointing a laser pointer at the Pacers bus and everything else that went on, flashing a gun at a strip club and all of that. There's one figure that I'm never going to get back. And here's seven more million dollars. And John ja Morant, his chance to make a ton of money is right now. Right, I don't think John Morant's going to go run a hedge fund uh, in New York City and Manhattan when he's done playing. So for that reason, that's it's significant. I mean, that's I, I guess if you want to, you know, Dan, you're you're the old coach. They always say you can you can really speak to your players through their butt on the bench. Well, I think you can speak to professional athletes through their wallet, and this is one way to get across to them that you're costing yourself millions and actually show him how much he's losing. No, I, I don't disagree. I, I, I wonder what's going to happen here moving forward. Like, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, what did you think about Huggins and his deal? Uh, I mean, Dan, haven't we all just, you know, driven to Pittsburgh, not knowing where we are and woke up and say, I, don't, I have no idea how I got here to Pittsburgh. It's a bad deal. <laughs> um, I, I just don't. Uh, 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 look, we, we know the issues. Like, I, I'm not even going to speculate here right now because we can probably go ahead and call it. He sounded drunk in that interview where he got in trouble, right? He was slurring his speech. It was early in the morning when he was on that, that Cincinnati radio station. I thought when I first heard it, is he drunk right now? Just the way he sounded when he was making those jokes that got him in trouble. Um, it seems like Bob Huggins needs to get help. You know, I, I'm no doctor. I, I, don't, I don't know what all is going on, but this seems to be a recurring issue with him, and I, I wish for the best for him. I don't think him coaching basketball right now or leading young men or leading a university's program is what's best for him. I think what's best is that he goes out and gets right. And uh, if he wants to make a run at trying to coach again at some point, if that's still in his blood and he wants to do it, then fine. But it does certainly seem like his time at West Virginia is, is over. Yeah, you know, I, I've said this. Maybe he likes that life. You know, I mean, maybe that's, you know, he's 69 years old. If you need help, go get yourself some damn help. You know, one of the things, and you've seen this, uh, coaches get to a point where they have their little kingdoms, right? Where they're, you know, king of the castle, man, no, untouchable. And Huggins, I think, got to that point. But, hey, look, I, I, I hope he gets whatever he needs if he needs it. But, again, I'm like you. I'm no doctor. But maybe he likes that life. Maybe it's like, all right, I'm going to have to deal with this. But, hey, screw that. This is the way I want to live my life. I, I don't know. But I'm with and, you. you I, coaching is I, – I thought he retired five years ago. True. In I, fact, I, I had a bunch of guys that I've worked with that said, look, he retired five years ago. He just didn't tell anybody. Well, and Dan, I think that it takes a special place. And I, I don't mean that as a compliment. But it takes a special place at a Power 5 job to have yourself so insulated. And I think Morgantown, West Virginia is probably one of those places, right? Sure. There are few places where you can be protected by local media, by your own fan base, and you can get away with a ton. There are a lot of other bigger programs that are very corporate. And I don't know if that's good or bad, but I don't think you could get away with a lot of the stuff Bob Huggins has probably gotten away with over the years at any other Power 5 job other than West Virginia and a handful of others where this could even take place. 
there are a lot of bigger jobs, bigger brands out there that if there are issues like this happening within the town, they're going to find out about it quickly. And you're probably going to be out of a job quickly, especially if you're a team not making the NCAA tournament, you're really going to be out of a job quickly. So I think West Virginia is one of those special type of programs. And I'm not saying again, not saying that as a compliment where you can probably get away with a lot in that town and within that university. I think Bob Huggins has proven that the fact that he wasn't let go when, when the, the statements were made on the Cincinnati radio station and now it took this to probably get him to force a resignation. But I just don't think there's a lot of power five jobs, big time college basketball jobs out there where you can be the face of that university's program and get away with a lot of stuff today because people are going to see it. Everyone's got one of these. Everybody's got a cell phone out there. Everything's on video. You know, everything can be tracked. So it, it's tough to get away with a lot of stuff these days. Now, I agree with you, but. I think there's a lot of guys getting away with a lot of stuff. One thing about Huggins, and I'm fast. I'm I'm very fascinated by this. I I really am. I'm fascinated by, and I've always been. I I've always liked Bob. I've never respected him ever since he had strippers every week at his kids' basketball camp uh, in Cincinnati in the locker room. High school coaches used to flock to, to Huggins' camp. I'm like, why you guys won't work Huggins' camp when I was trying to get guys to work our camp? Because Dan, he's got strippers in the locker room. I'm like, really? <laughs> in a locker room? So I feel like Huggins is ending uh, is kind of the way it it all began. I you know I just do I love primetime U.S. Open golf, big boy. Give me primetime U.S. Open golf. And I looked up last night and I think that Wyndham Clark was on hole fifteen or sixteen, and it was it's still daylight outside in the Central Time Zone. And I'm thinking, man, you know this is just a normal. You know, Sunday, late afternoon, golf, and I look down, I'm like, oh, no, it's 8 o'clock. It's 8.15 Central Time. I'm in prime time, baby. Prime time U.S. Open. I, I liked it, too. Uh, you know, it was it, it got me to my normal Sunday night TV viewing a little bit later. But the fact that you could sit there and watch the finish of that tournament, and what a great story with Wyndham Clark taking it home after losing his mother when he was in college and contemplating quitting the game and all of that really cool human interest story with him. But to see that determination on that walk down the fairway on 17 and 18 from Wyndham Clark was really cool to see. And to see it in prime time for the rest of the country, I love it. Keep it coming. You know, on Thursday, I was expecting a little bit more out of L.A. Country Club because of all the hype leading up to that. And I guess it was because it was that marine layer or whatever they call it, the clouds over the over the course didn't make it look as good. I thought it looked great over the weekend when the sunshine came out. It was cool seeing the, the Playboy Mansion and the buildings in Beverly Hills around it. And then you could see downtown LA off in the distance. Uh, it was a really cool uh, event over the weekend. And to see it in prime time on a Sunday night, I think made it all the better. I completely agree. Like I, I it, it looked like a couple times, like, are they playing in Vegas? It's pretty cool. And the, the Playboy mansion, uh, it, it, I thought at a one point, I forget who said something about it. There's some weird noises coming out of there. Of course they got a, zoo there they're like well there have been weird noises coming out of there for a long long time i like that kind of stuff chad i do i i like that kind of stuff yeah he said so it overlooks 14 i think and i believe it was yeah. dan hicks for nbc on the call he made a comment as wyndham clark was coming through you know this is an area that's seen a lot of action over the years so he said they were talking about the shot that was coming up on the green he's like there's the playboy mansion right behind it and it had the scaffolding all over it Apparently, it's under renovation. It's no longer the Playboy Mansion. I don't know who owns it. I wish we got more backstory on who purchased the Playboy Mansion from the Hefner Estate, or is it in some sort of trust? Is it going to be some sort of theme park? You know, what are they going to do with it? Is it just a private residence for some, you know, rich person in, in LA? I, I have no idea, but pretty cool to see that right there and know that the whole time the backside of that mansion is the 14th green at the LA country club. I, I had no idea. Um, it was, it was cool to see that, you know, the sights of that and know how many big time celebrities are members at that course and have played there a lot. You know, the guy's name, I looked this up before his name is Dean Metropolis. He is a, I, I don't know what you call him, a hedge fund guy. He's a billionaire. He bought it for a hundred million. And one of the things that when he bought it, he had to maintain the zoo. Like that was a big deal 
to Hefner or Hefner's people. Um, they said that the main structure of the building was going to be maintained, now renovated, and the zoo uh, had to be kept. So, you know, there you go. Hefner bought it for a million. He sold it for a hundred million and 18 bazillion dollars involved in the stories at that place. Hey, speaking this guy, of hold on, Dan. This guy's name was Dean uh, Metropolis. That's a real name. He didn't make that yeah. name up. That is a terrific <laughs> name if he didn't. I figured that was a stage name when I heard Dean Metropolis. If that's his real name, that, you know that is a name about? destined for greatness right there, Dan. That's a guy who was born yeah. to one day buy the Playboy Mansion from Hugh Hefner. When you're born Dean Metropolis, you're going to do big yeah. things. He owns Hostess. So all your Hostess brands, your Suzy Q's, your Cupcakes, your Ding Dongs, uh, he's a co-owner uh, of Hostess. And, uh, yeah, he paid a million. Uh, he, he, uh, he, or I'm sorry, he paid a hundred million. So, um, there you go. He's renovating it for one lot of ding dongs, uh, million, <laughs> a lot of ding. I, I was a Susie Q guy and a Twinkie guy, but that's a lot of ding dongs. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for your time today. Look forward Dan, to your thank show. you, buddy. Thanks, brother. Yep. Appreciate you. All right. All right. We didn't talk. Uh, I haven't talked much today about the trade for Bradley Beal. Look, here's the deal. I mean, as soon as I saw the trade, what are you going to see? Oh, my God. Another team. Who's going to handle Durant and Ayton and Booker and Beal? Nah, I don't know. Nobody. Nobody's going to handle them. I promise you, nobody's going to handle them. Nobody in the world can handle these three guys. Nobody. Yes, they are uh, title favorites. Yes, Bradley Beal, who has won nothing, who shoots a lot, is going to be the guy. So Chris Paul is part of the trade. Looks like Chris Paul at 38, 39 years old. We end up back with the Clippers, with Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. Another team that, hey, nobody's going to handle. All the little white dudes. Oh, they got Bradley Beal. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, you ever see them white dudes, them fat shaved head white dudes in white t-shirts and gold chains that go to NBA games. And as soon as somebody dunks, they turn to their African-American friends and just do what they do. Oh, (laughs) Oh, man, the world is a crazy place, but that's what we got. Uh, Don't at me about Bob Huggins. Bob Huggins retired five years ago. He just didn't tell anybody. He didn't. And the media, like Bob Herzl and the idiots in West Virginia, they just protected his fat ass. They just protected him from anything. They protected him from everything. They did. So you can get mad at me, but that's what they did. My favorite story, though, is, and let's revisit this, fellas. So John Morant, we just talked about with our friend Chad Withrow. John Morant has gun trouble. And, of course, NFL and NBA players who are the dumbest of the dumb with their second-grade educations, but they have to chime in, and Jack Jones is no different. Jack Jones, a nondescript guy from the New England Patriots, he had chimed in and said, yo, you are yo dumb, yo. Well, guess what? Jack Jones just got arrested in the airport with two guns in his carry-on. He was charged with two counts of five different charges. And this wasn't this idiot's first arrest. So think about this. It's his backpack. Oh man, I didn't know I had my, I didn't know I had my straps with me. (laughs) My strap. If I want to be a hip cat, I call it a strap. And I got one in a hole for yes. No, I got to go like that, right? If I really want to be a gangster. Whatever happened to fist fighting? Those are the two guns that idiot had. And if you've ever held guns like that, they're kind of heavy. So I don't know what he keeps in his backpack on a daily basis, but I got to ask, your backpack didn't feel a little heavy, clown? I, you, you missed it? So anyway, let's go to Jack Jones's tweet where he admonishes, he admonishes John Morant. Dumb. You letting social media and yo pride ruin yo real money. Put them guns down and run that money up. Make one of yo homies sign up for security or concealed carry 
if you feel like you need it that bad. But you the breadwinner, you got to start acting like it. Okay, Jack Jones. (laughs) Carry that around. Get a super soaker. Put like, I don't know, vodka in it. Hey, look, I know you're trying to rob me, but I'm going to get you drunk. Open your mouth. (laughs) Jack Jones. Oh, hey, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to continue this rampage. I don't know about you, but the Cincinnati Reds are fun. The Cincinnati Reds aren't sort of, kind of, maybe fun. I'm going to probably talk about this. This may be your daily Reds update. Hey, they're not going to do nothing, and they're going to fall back, and I don't care. They're fun to watch. They've won eight in a row. Listen to this. The Cincinnati Reds are over 500. Remember they started out like one in 50? They're 37 and 35. They've won eight in a row after losing two in a row. And they had a guy yesterday who's unbelievable. Ellie De La Cruz hit a shot to first base. The first base dove behind the bag. He was a little bit deep. And Ellie De La Cruz beat him to the bag. I've never seen that before. I've seen it close. I have never seen That's what I'm saying. The Reds are fun. The Reds get after it. The Reds hustle. The Reds take the extra base. They do. Don't at me, people. And if you're going to at me, bring the noise and bring the funk because you're wrong. Cubs have won seven of the last ten. They're kind of fun. I think I'm going to go in a couple weeks. What the hell? Yeah. I said it, and I meant it. We woke a doping. Who's the dope? Who's the woke? Let's get it on, baby. We got three of them. Let's get it on. Man, let me tell you something. We didn't show the video, did we? Do we? Hey, hey, say in my ear, do we have the video of Biden? Do we have the video of Dumb and Dumber, Biden and uh, Fetterman? Do we have that video? And now I'm standing next to the president again, next to a, a collapsed bridge here. And he is here to commit to work with the, the governor and the, the, the delegation to make sure that we get this fixed quick fast as well, too. This is a president that is committed to infrastructure. Yeah. And then on top of that, uh, the, the jewel uh, kind of a uh, l- uh, law of the inf- inflation uh, uh, bill that is going to make sure that there's going to be bridges all across like this, all across the America getting rebuilt. How about that? How about Fetterman shows up in shorts and a hoodie? to meet the president of the United States. Look, I don't know. We all know this is the worst administration. This is the worst we've ever had it in our country. Last week, we had perverts running all over the White House lawn topless. This week, or I guess last week still, we had that. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, that. Now, When you look at the best of the best in our country, I don't blame you for not running for Congress. I don't blame you for not running for election. I mean, how could you? It's impossible. But it shouldn't get to that. It shouldn't get to a guy who can't speak, had a stroke, and and being the lead guy, the lead senator in Pennsylvania, one of the leading senators in the country, and a president that literally doesn't know where he is. We, we got to do better. I don't care. Look, if you're a Democrat, don't bother criticizing me for this stance because I can't help you. If you're stupid enough and you have the whole Trump is the worst human being alive, no matter what he did, no matter what his record says, then I can't help you and you can't help me because I'm not going to change your mind and you're not going to change my mind. But that right there is one of the most absurd things I have ever seen. You have a bridge collapse. Now, uh, Biden hurried out there. He hasn't been to East Palestine, Ohio. Why? Because Ohio doesn't vote for him. That's the level we have here. And that's the level of guy that (laughs) is a congressman. I can't help you. I'm sorry. We live, it's the worst times we've ever had. Go ahead. What's next? Man. (laughs) 
Oh, man. Look, there's a drinking fountain in the bathroom. Uh, for those of you that don't know and will defend Joe Biden, it's called a bidet. A, ba- a bidet. A ba- bidet. It's called a baden. <laughs> oh, my God. Come on. Dan Fetterman has to wear those clothes because he can't button a shirt. They didn't want Dr. Oz. They wanted Fetterman. And we wanted this guy. All right. Okay. All right. We got one more? It's unbelievable. Because these are true. He actually did drink from a bidet. No, he didn't. (laughs) I guess we got two. Oh, man. Look, I can't help you. Uh, Dumb and dumber. Did he call Biden a collapsed bridge? Yes, he did. He called Biden a collapsed bridge. These are the worst times we've ever had. When you look at politics, Ali, you can argue, you can not. I, look, if you're defending that, I, God bless you. I don't even, I don't, I can't argue with you. Because what you see out of our politicians every day is indefensible. You cannot defend this. I'm sorry. You can't. All right. God save the queen, man. There you go. God save the queen, man. God save the queen, man. You know what? Biden is that guy who tries so hard to be cool, tries so hard to be tough, tries so hard to be a guy's guy. And we all knew him in college. The little frat boy who was such a D-bag. He was comfortable, I guess, hitting on sorority girls. I always tried to give the people a little different. I always went more towards Fetterman than I do a suit and tie because the frat boys had the collars up when I was in school, the Izod shirts. I had Munson wear. That's right, Penguin. And I liked it. I had my Indiana basketball shirt because it fit me and it was comfortable. Biden's that guy that tries so hard to be tough. He's got his aviator shades. And by the way, Joe Biden, sad that he lost two of his children, obviously, but is anybody more of a fraud on Father's Day than Joe Biden? Joe Biden raised a, like his daughter was afraid to be in the shower with him. What? I mean, look, when you're a little kid, little girl, okay, you take your daughter in the shower, you wipe her ass, you clean her up, and away you go, but not when she's like 12. (laughs) Your son, you put him on, you wipe his ass, you go. But now when he's like 12, what are you doing? World is a crazy place, and it is. It's the worst times we've ever, ever had. It is. Our media is corrupt. Imagine, and you're right, Linda, can you imagine the uproar if Trump said that? Can you imagine? It's unbelievable. <laughs> Cannot thank the YouTube chat enough. Lively all day. We got to get tomorrow going. Got to have a big day tomorrow. I think Carton's going to join us. Craig Carton, I think he just signed a big deal uh, with Fox. He's leaving WFAN, and I'm watching his show every day. I could not watch any more of ESPN today. We're celebrating George Floyd. Happy June, uh, Juneteenth. Hey, great day. Slavery gone. Fantastic back in the day. But I don't want to hear about uh, criminals being celebrated. I just don't. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't. Uh, cops were wrong. Absolutely wrong. But criminals should not be celebrated. Just my take. All right. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Ryan. See you tomorrow.